there's anybody in the building besides me who got some real problems. Yeah. got some real problems, some real worship will take care of all your real problems. Because worship invokes the presence of God. But you do understand that God and the enemy cannot occupy the same space at the same time. You begin to worship the Lord. The Lord comes and He sits down on your situation. And see, that's why the enemy didn't want you to come to church in the morning. Have you ever wondered why it is that you have no problems getting yourself together every other day of the week with the exception of Sunday? Monday through Friday, you have no problems. Starts up. You have no problems with the children. You have no problems finding your clothes. Everything works together. But for some reason, on Sunday morning, you go to the car and your car won't stop. Try to go there and you got to run in your stocking. You got to catch up on your shirt. Your left shoe is playing hide and go seek with your right shoe. The kids. I act in crazy. Everything goes tops and turns because the enemy knows that if you can get to the house of the Lord, that no matter what you're going through during the week, that somehow or another the Lord will make a way. But you know what? I made up my mind that I'm not going to allow anything to keep me from the house of the Lord. If I can't find my shoes, I come to the church barefooted. But I won't start. I catch the bus, and the bus is late. I start to walk. If I can't find any clothes, I cook. Listen, I put some shirts on, but I ain't gonna let nothing to keep me from the house of the Lord. Because I know when I get here, my peace is here, my joy is here, my cup is there. Walker, First Lady of Little Rock, to 
Reverend Armstrong, General Officer of our church, to Mrs. Vilma D. Leak, former Missionary Supervisor and General Officer of our church, uh, to all of the ecclesiasticians who join us here in the pulpit and those who may be in the pew, to the officers and to the members of this Little Rock AM Zion Church. I greet you this morning in the matchless, magnanimous, marvelous, and majestic name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ, who once was dead, but we thank God that he is alive. Yes. September the 12th, 2010, I'm happy to declare that he is alive. Yes. He is alive in the life of the Words really cannot express the debt of gratitude that I have to have again this opportunity to stand in this sacred spot to proclaim the unadulterated word of God. I realize that many of you would have hoped to have been sitting at the feet of a bishop this morning. And to be honest with you, I would have hoped to be sitting at his feet as well. But we thank God that he is still Jehovah Rapha. And that he is a healer. And that earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. And we do praise God uh, that he is recuperating uh, very well from surgery. I really cannot and will never attempt to stand in his shoes uh, because those are some mighty big shoes to feel. And we praise God for his ministry and for all that he has continued to do for God and for Zion. And we ask for him, your continued prayers. But I do thank God for brother and your pastor, and for uh, this wonderful demonstration of what uh, can happen again when uh, the pulpit and the pew comes together. Little Rock, I want you to know that you stand as a prototype uh, for the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church and for what outstanding and excellent ministry ought to look like. And we praise God for your 127 years that you have been a leading congregation in our Zion. And we pray for the next 127 years that they will be as successful as the former. Please know that this morning I just believe that we ought to celebrate this pastor and this ministerial team for what God has continued to do in the life of Little Rock African Methodist Episcopal Zion. Come on, God. I want y'all to know, in case you don't know, let me remind you that your pastor loves you. He loves you from the depths of his soul. And from what I can see and from what I can feel, I believe that you love him too. Amen. And we pray and praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, praise God, for what he will continue to do on his pastoral leader, leadership and guidance. There is a word from the Lord on this morning. And it is found in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 2. And we shall commence our reading at verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2. Beginning at verse 4. And you have. Who were dead 
forgetting trespasses and sins. Where again in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sin hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The word of God. For the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Come down, count word, gird on thy mighty sword, our prayer attend. Come and thy people bless. Come give thy word success. Spirit of holiness on us descend. Grant me now, God, that anointing that makes preaching possible. Take me out of me and fill me with them, that you might receive all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name. Somebody shout in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to use this morning as a subject what it means to be saved. What it means to be saved. If one were to embark on a journey through biblical scripture, they will soon discover that the Bible is a continuous progression of God's redemptive love and power. The Bible is not stagnant, it is not stifled, it is not stuck, but from Genesis to Revelation, the reader is taken through the trails and pathways, peaks and the valleys of God's divine intrusion on mankind. On this biblical excursion, the reader is able to sniff the roses of the, of the creative, the creation narrative. They're able to feel the pain and agony of a people held in captivity. They're able to get their clothes soaked with the water of a divided sea. They're able to taste the milk and honey of a promised land. 
smell the stench of a dirty manger. They're able to get their hands soiled with the blood from a hill called Calvary yes, and rejoice in the reality of an empty tomb. Yes, sir. Yes. The Bible, I tell you, is going somewhere. Yes, Some theologians suggest that the Bible moves in a straight line, that it goes from point A to point B. Others suggest that it is circular in motion, that there is no break between what happens in Genesis and what happens in Revelation. That all of the events are somehow intricately connected. But regardless of how it moves, the important fact is that the Bible does move. Yes, Such as life. Life, like the Word of God, is a continuous progression. Yes, sir. It moves from infancy to childhood, from childhood to adolescence, from adolescence to adulthood. And whether you want to admit it or not, you can't do what you used to do as well as you used to do it. Hello, somebody. You can't run as fast as you used to run. You can't jump as high as you used to jump. You can't see as far as you used to see. And if you think your hair is going to remain dark and lovely, you got another thing coming. Listen, I, I never shall forget the words of my father when I began to tease him about his receding hairline. He, he, he looked at me and said, son, I want to tell you something that you're going to remember for the rest of your life. He said, as you are, I once was. <laughs> and as I am, you very soon will be. In other words, he's trying to tell me that life moves, life changes, and, and that life is going somewhere. Uh, but, 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 but if you allow me, I want to talk for just a few minutes about life's ultimate movement. Yes, sir. When we move from time to eternity. Uh, listen, I have an announcement to make. I know that you're not going to like this. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm making that disclaimer even right now. You're not going to like it. You don't want to hear it. But I have an announcement to make this morning. And that announcement is that all of us up in here, up in here, at some point or another, will die. Amen. Hello, somebody. I, I knew you wouldn't like that. I knew, I knew you didn't like that, but... But, 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 but I need you to know that all of us have an appointment that we must keep. You got to know that you didn't come here to stay. That, that you strolled in church today, but you can be rolled in church tomorrow. You, you came here walking on top of the dirt today, but at some point the dirt is going to be on top of you, uh, uh, that all of us at some point or another will make our transition. And, and, and that's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality all of us have a date with death uh, but now that I've made that announcement I got one more and that is because of that reality that I am so glad. Can I say that one more time? I am so glad that I'm saved. Hello, somebody. I'm, 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 I'm so glad that I, I know the Lord for myself. Because, because you, you, got, you got to understand that 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 sound. 
salvation, the salvation is a fundamental of our faith. And, and, and just, just as running and hitting and throwing and catching is a fundamental of baseball, and just as running and dribbling and shooting is a fundamental of basketball, and just as being able to subtract, add, multiply, and divide is a fundamental of mathematics, you got to understand uh, that salvation is a fundamental of Christianity. Uh, but, but sometimes, y'all, the church stands guilty, the, the church stands guilty of focusing on other things other than the fundamentals of Christianity. We Sometimes we get so consumed with general claims and we get so consumed with special things that we forget uh, that the fundamental, the fundamental and mission of the church is that all should be saved and none should be lost. Listen, it's, it, it's good that we have people in the choir. It's good that we have people on the worship hall. It's good that we have people in other activities of the church. But see, the, the mission is not just for them to be in the church, but the mission is that those who are in the church will be in the law. Because you do understand that there is a difference between being in the church and being in the law. You got a whole lot of folk who are in the church, but you don't have too many people who are in the law. See, when you are in the church, you can sit in the sanctuary, but when you are in the law, you are sitting in his very presence. When you are in the church, I wish I had some help in the house. When you are in the church, you can sing songs from your mouth. But when you are in the Lord, you sing songs from your heart. When you are in the church, in, in, in the church uh, you can read the Bible words that are in the Bible, and they're just that, mere words. But when you when you are in the Lord, when you read the words, they are words to live by. And I just wonder this morning, is there anybody else in the building who is in the law? When you are in the church, your name will be on the church row. But when you are in the Lord, your name is on the Lamb's book of life. Is there anybody in the building who knows that you're in the Lord? Am I the only one? Aren't you glad you're saved? Aren't you glad you know him for yourself? Aren't you glad that it ain't about your mama's religion or your daddy's religion or your granddaddy's religion? But aren't you glad that you know him for yourself? I am so glad. I am so glad that I'm saved. But listen, let's, let's check this out, y'all. But, but see, but the church uh, can also be found guilty of propagating a very narrow and myopic view of salvation. We only focus on the eschatological implications of salvation at the expense of uh, the temporal benefits. Can I say that one more time? We only focus on the eschatological uh, implications of salvation at the expense of the temporal benefits. In other words, we focus more on the thereafter at the expense of the here and now. Now, listen, don't get me wrong. I am glad that one glad morning when this life is over, I'm going to fly away to be at rest. I'm excited that when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that would be. When we all see Jesus, we're going to sing and we're going to shout the victory. Listen, listen, I am excited that, 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 that one black morning, listen, I, 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 I too want to seek him and I too want to look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace. Listen, 
on the streets of glory. Yes, I too am going to lift my voice. Hold our cares all past. Hold at last ever to rejoice. Listen, but I need you to know that there is another side to salvation. Hello, somebody. That, 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 that there is that there is another side, and 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 we get so caught up with what Jesus saved us from that we don't spend any time talking about what Jesus has saved us to. Yes, Jesus has saved us from our sins, and He has saved us from eternal damnation. But I need you to understand that not only has He saved us from something, but he has also saved us for something. The for is in, in the, the from is in the future, but the for is right now. And as a result of us spending more time talking about future benefits of salvation as opposed to temporal benefits of salvation, as a result we have a church full of impotence, depressed and defeated people who are like the man sitting by the pool of Bethesda for 25 years waiting for somebody else to put him in the pool. We are like, we have a whole lot of people who, who are sitting around whining and complaining about where they are and about what they are going through where all we have to do is call on the name of Jesus and somehow or another we will be healed. Yes, check it out y'all. Yes, he saved us from our sins and yes, he saved us from eternal damnation but that was then. But he also saved us from something which is right now. So while we are waiting on God to take us to Him, God is waiting on us to bring heaven down to the earth. I think I just said something. While we are waiting for God to take us on the flowery path of need, God is waiting on us to bring heaven down to the earth. That's why the Lord's Prayer says, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen, it's a matter of the gospel that tells a mother that you have to wait until you die for your wayward child to come home. Listen, it's a poor gospel that tells a father that you got to wait until the afterlife before you're able to be a responsible parent. Listen, it's a, 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 a mighty poor gospel that tells a community that we have to wait until the rapture before our young people stop killing one another. It's a mighty poor gospel that tells people that they have to wait until the trumpet sounds before the judgment, uh, before uh, they are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I need you to know that God not only saved us for the future, but he saved us for right now. Listen, that, that kind of theology is even diametrically opposed to the ministry of Jesus Christ. When Jesus saw the 5,000 who were hungry, he didn't say, uh, y'all gotta wait and I will feed you later. He saw them hungry and he fed them now. When Jesus saw the disciples out there on the, uh, on the waters and the storm arose, he didn't say, y'all wait and then I'll calm the, the sea. But he saw the storm and he said, peace be still now. Hello, somebody. When he saw, uh, he heard uh, uh, Mary and Martha and crying, saying that if you had been here, our brother would not have died. He didn't say, well, you got to wait until the resurrection for him to get up. He says, Lazarus, I want you to get up now. When, Brian, when he heard Brian Bartimaeus calling out to him, he didn't say, you got to wait uh, uh, until you hear the trumpet sound. He said, listen, I am going to heal you and you are going to be able 
to see right now. And I just believe, y'all, that we got some fun in the building who got some issues and got some problems and you got some issues right now. You going through now. You sick now. You in trouble now. You got mountains now. You got violence now. You got deals now. You got trouble right now. Listen, and whoever you needed in the Lord before, you sure do need him right now. Am I the only one who has hard times? Am I the only one who has some issues that need to be dealt with? But I'm so glad that the Lord can deal with them and He can deal with them right now. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I, I just want to say, God bless me now. No, say that to God bless me now. God heal me now. God lift me now. God cover me now. Wipe the tears now. Put my heart back together now. And listen, this, this, this thing is my Paul is preaching to the church. He's writing to the church today. Your potential better than you do. And that's 
why he is, is, is trying to keep you and prevent you from reaching your destiny. You got to understand, you got to understand that, that, that Lucifer was the, the chief chap. He was the one who was in charge of the worship of God in him. But then one day he walked past a mirror and he got full of himself. He, he thought he was all that in a bag of chips. He said, well, because I look so good and because I can sing so good, I think the angels ought to praise me as opposed to giving honor and praise to God. And as a, as a result, God kicked him out of heaven. And Ezekiel said that he came down here to the earth realm. But then God created Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve was to be God's representative of heaven on the earth. And so he gave Adam the dominion and power over the things in the enemy's territory. He said, you have power and dominion that, that whatever you say and whatever you speak, it shall come to pass. So because the enemy knew about Adam's potential, he did everything he can to strip him of his authority and his dominion that was given to him by God. And said, all you need to do is eat from this this tree of the knowledge of good and evil and as a result of their sin they were stripped of their authority but I'm so glad that that was not the end of the story God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross so that we can be regenerated that, uh, that we can re we, we regain the authority that we once had. So because you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, you now, brother, you now, sister, you now, man, you now, woman, you now, boy, you now, girl, have authority over the enemy. I wish I had some help. That's, 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 what, that's what Paul is saying here in Ephesians chapter 2. He said, look man, he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He says here, he says here, uh, wherefore, for we are his workmanship. I like that, y'all. In, 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 in other words, it means that God intentionally fashioned and formed you in his image. And in time past, and, and, and created, and we, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So in order to keep you from walking, I wish I had some people in the house, in your authority, the enemy then wants to uh, hijack your potential. Hello, somebody. The enemy, the enemy wants to hijack your potential. He, 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 he wants to incarcerate your imagination. He wants to arrest your destiny so that you will not become and that you will not be and walk in the authority that has been given to you through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. And, 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 what's, and what makes matters worse is that, is that many of us right now are in a prison. And not only are we in prison, but the devil has made you the warning. Y'all miss that. You got too many people who are in prison, and they are in prison, and, they, and the enemy has given you the keys, but you are the one who is locking yourself up from becoming what God. 
Dr. Naeem Akbar wrote a, a book entitled the, uh, the Chains and Images of Psychological Slavery. And in this book, he asserts that uh, chattel slavery is one of the worst forms of slavery ever in, in human history. Uh, that, that, that what happened to the Jews was bad, but what happened to the Jews was a physical slavery. But what happened to Africans was a psychological slavery. Because the, the so-called masters understood psychological warfare. Because they understood that where your mind goes, your behind is going to follow. So they did not have to build, uh, get, put chains on them. They put chains on their minds. They didn't have to put them in a physical prison, but they put them in a mental prison. And by putting them in a mental prison, uh, they would remain slaves for the rest of their lives. And see, and what has happened is, is that we got too many people who are in a mental and psychological prison. You don't believe that you can be more than what you are. They people who, uh, see, I want you to understand, y'all, that people who have no goals and no aspirations scare me. Hello, somebody. They scare me. You wonder why they scare me? They scare me because not only are they going nowhere, but they're going to do everything they can to make sure that you don't go nowhere. They don't have nothing. Don't want you to have nothing. They ain't got no job, don't want you to have no job. They ain't got no man, don't want you to have no man. They ain't got no car, don't want you to have no car. And they will try their best to keep you with them. But you got to be able to look at them and say, get the road shut and don't you come back. No more, no more, no more. I wish I had some help in the house. Because the fact of the matter is, you got to know your potential. And you got to be able to understand that because you have authority, you can speak to whatever situation that you're going through and say, no weapon formed against me is able to prosper. Listen, that's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds. But listen to this one. Casting down imaginations. There's the key. And every high force in the mind Hello, somebody. Uh, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. In other words, what Paul is saying is that you got to be able to speak to your situation because see, the devil is not after your car. He's after your mind. He's not after your body. He's after your mind. He's not after your relationship. He's after your mind. Cause he got your mind. He got your body. He got your relationship. He got your family. But you got to be able to stand and look the enemy in the eye and say, in the name of Jesus, I decree and I declare. Listen, when I was, when I was, when I was, when I was, when I was a, a young boy, when I was a young boy, I used to love playing um, cowboys and Indians. Hello, somebody. And of course, I would always want to be the cowboy. Because if I was a cowboy, that means that I could chase after the Indian. And when I would chase after the Indian, we would have a little rope. And we would tie all the 
Indians up because they can no longer run amok in our lives. Hello, somebody. And do what they wanted to do. But Paul says, listen, if you want to really know the power of your potential, uh, you've got to imagine yourself as a cowboy. And bring everything, every, cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity. So what we used to do, y'all, was this. We would get a long rope. <laughs> Hello, somebody. And we would tie up every enemy that we knew was going to do us a harm. And I want you to know this morning that God has sent me the little rock to tell somebody uh, that you are now a spiritual cowboy. been running a rough shot over your life long enough. So you got to get your rope and bring everything that the enemy has declared and told you into captivity. I wish I had some help. Come here, doubt. You got to bring that holiness and bring it into captivity. Come here, low self-esteem. You got to bring low self-esteem and bring it in under captivity. Come here, alcoholism. You got to bring alcoholism and bring it under captivity. Come here, drug abuse. You got to bring drug abuse and put it. Come here for the patient. You got to be for the patient and put it in captivity. Come here, poverty. You got to put poverty and bring it into captivity. Come here. Who are you? Whoever you are. And you got to put it and bring it under captivity. Because you understand that because of the blood of Jesus, that no matter what the enemy has said, you got power, you got might to get it out of your life. Is there anybody who got power? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Put it in subjection. Information. Yeah. Yeah. You see, we got a whole lot of folk who have information. Yeah. 
But if you have information and don't have any revelation, then you still have absolutely nothing. Because when you have information, you can know that the Lord is a healer. But it's only until you have revelation that that healing becomes real in your life. If you have information, you will know that he will make a way. But it's only when you have a revelation that the way will be made in your life. And listen, I'm tired of people in the church who only have information. I'm tired of folk ministering in the church who only have information. Because the fact of the matter is, no matter how well you can sing, if you don't have revelation, nobody will be saved. No matter how well you can preach, if you don't have revelation, nobody will be delivered. Is there anybody in the building who needs to have some revelation as to who God is in your life? Yeah, and see, listen, when you have revelation, you are then able to speak to yourself. Listen, before you were speaking to your situation, but when you have a revelation, you can speak to yourself and look yourself in the mirror. Y'all remember Purple Rain? Y'all remember Purple Rain, don't you? Y'all remember Morris Day at the time? But when the, the song got real good, Morris Day would say, come here, Jerome. And Jerome would stand up and have a big old mirror. And Morris Day would look at himself in the mirror and begin to speak to himself. And I'm telling you right now that some of y'all in the building, you need to have a revelation. And when you have a revelation, you can speak to yourself. Yeah, information says you don't have enough education. But a revelation says I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Information says you lost your job. You can't pay your bills. But a revelation says what God will supply. says you don't have what it takes but revelation says greater is he that's on the inside of me than he does in the world information says depression is no but revelation says weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning Says you'll never amount to anything, but revelation says you are a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Yeah, information says you're the wrong color, but revelation says you're the head and not the tail. chapter 2 and I looked at verse number 6 and it said that he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places which means that right now in the spirit realm I am sitting on the right hand in heavenly places. But then I read first Ephesians 
the first chapter and the 22nd verse. And it said that he put all things under his feet. I said, what? If I'm sitting at the right hand of God in and through Jesus Christ, and if Jesus Christ has all things under his feet, that means that I should be controlling my problems instead of my problems controlling me. You see, you got the enemy in the wrong place. You got the enemy up here when he really needs to be under your feet. And because he's under your feet, that was the one revelation. But y'all know another revelation I had? I got a revelation, y'all, that there is power in the feet. I know that wasn't grammatically correct, but say what being there. There's power in the feet. God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, as far as you can see, eastward, westward, northward, southward, it all belongs to you. He told him to arise and walk. Oh! 